Great, thank you. Um, and thanks for having us. So um, I'm sure many of you in the room know who Nemours is because of Debbie um, sitting on the round table, but just briefly for those of you who don't, we're an operating foundation that provides integrated child health um, services in the Delaware Valley and Northern Central Florida. Um, and early on in the work that we do in prevention, re recognize that education, both early care and education and K through 12, was really going to be critical for the work that we're doing um, in reaching kids in the places where they live, learn, and play. And so I'm gonna share with you um, a little bit of information about two initiatives that we're running in several states across the country. And then my colleague, um, Dave, is gonna share with you some more information on um, a number of programs that we're running in Delaware, and really talk about the linkages that we're seeing between um, the education system and the health system. So why no more and why prevention? And I think, you know, as a health system, we've really started to think about what else can we bring to the table? We know that it's simply not health that's going to create the types of outcomes that we want to see for the kids as we're trying to keep them the healthiest that they can be. Um, you can note that the ability to read is a major predictor of adult health status. Um, prevention provides long-term benefits. We saw the cost curves this morning um, in terms of how those can bend. The societal health issues upstream, downstream, and families, and trying to incorporate the family into the thinking of um, how to improve the health of the child. And we really thought about it from a comprehensive approach. Um, you know, it was never a single sector that was going to be able to solve this issue, not the health system, not the education system. We've heard that the silos that came up before that list probably could go on. Um, we probably could have a quite an impressive farm of silos. Um, but we do know that if those are working together and cross-referencing um, each other, that there are synergies that can be found and outcomes that can be achieved. And so we really thought about that comprehensive um, approach considering the health and well-being of the whole child, including the physical environment, the social needs of the child, um, the child's needs over the long term. So both um, vertical integration, horizontal integration, and now this lifespan integration as well. Um, and really thinking through how we can use medical models um, in analyzing outcomes in other sectors. And so our strategy has really been a prevention-oriented one um, that looks at making use of the socio-ecological model um, beyond the individual to look at a range of other factors. We try to use the plural a lot um, in the conversation that we're having as we focus on population health versus individual health, which is a shift for a health system um, where folks are used to thinking about the patient that's sitting in front of them versus the population um, as a whole. And we've done a lot of, um, had a lot of discussions within our own organization about the impact of thinking about the community um, and the impact that that has on treating the individual as well as the other way. Um, Thinking about strategic partnerships, I'm, I'm very thankful to see that a lot of the same um, items that have come up in earlier presentations today are coming up again here in terms of knowing the importance of strategic partnerships, being able to talk across the silos with a shared language. Language becomes a huge issue um, when going across the sectors. Um, thinking about how we can provide materials and tools to make these turnkey solutions so that it's not extra work um, on other sectors because we're asking them to take something on. And then thinking about how we can use social marketing, et cetera, to really accelerate that social policy and practice change that we're looking for. So I want to talk with you about two programs, one around early literacy and one around um, healthy eating and physical activity. Nemours Bright Start um, is focused on early literacy and really developing materials and services targeted to young children um, who are at risk for reading um, problems and to teach them how to move um, along the journey of becoming readers. And it, incorporates all of the things that we talked about before in terms of ensuring that it's not just the child who's at the focus of that, but also thinking about what role are parents playing, teachers, healthcare providers, the community, leaders, et cetera, and policymakers, so that we can understand the concepts that are at play and move forward in all of those areas in order to get to the outcomes we're looking for. Um, and so really in a more bright start, we really see sitting at, the, at that crux, that center of all of those different components of healthcare, education, Thinking also about research and application and how can we bridge those sectors and, and applications as well. So what do we do in Bright Start? Um, we do screen um, ch all children who are four or five years old using a quick sound measure. Um, we intervene if a child is found to be at risk. There is a small group instruction over 20 lessons for children at risk for reading failure. Um, and then we rescreen. And part of what I wanted to talk about today is that we do have some great data coming out of this intervention in terms of four years of cluster randomized studies, which I don't get to talk about that often in the work that I do. Um, 
and, and I spend a lot of time telling people that we don't need to do this, um, that we should think about other methods for evaluation, but it's also really exciting sometimes to share the quote unquote gold standard of evaluation in talking through an initiative. And so we have had four years of cluster randomized studies um, of Bright Start taking place in the natural environment using the child care centers and preschools, um, not excluding any children. Um, those of you who spend more time in research than I do know how important all of these things are. Um, it's been a while since I've been in my epidemiology and my research classes, but we do know that there are key comparisons that we wanted to look at in terms of intervention and um, non-intervention groups and really thinking about what role zip code plays. We heard that this morning, um, financial subsidy, et cetera, um, and used a number of analytic strategies along the way to really look at the data. Um, we do have a ton of charts. I don't have a lot of time to show you, so I won't go through all of those. We do have them if anyone is interested. But what we do know is that there were over 13,000 pre-kindergartners screened, and over 3,300 of them received the Bright Start intervention. Um, and two-thirds of those moved um, to the age-appropriate range in reading readiness skills after the intervention, and that 70% or more achieved post-test standard scores of 90 or above. And the great part about this is we're also seeing these sustained as these children move into grade three. Um, so these are changes that are happening relatively quickly after the intervention and then also having a sustained impact. And so um, it's both those short-term gains and those longer-term gains that we're looking for. Um, we did see a positive impact, as I mentioned. Um, we've been able to use the data not only to know is it working, but also to make changes. So I mentioned that there's four years of data. Um, at each of those iterations, we were able to tweak the intervention um, in order to respond to weaknesses that were being found um, in the intervention and in order to ensure that more children were going to benefit, more children at all risk levels were going to benefit. Um, and also think about more ways to enhance areas of weakness, um, which in our case was around phonological awareness at the young age. Um, and you know, this ties a lot to what um, my uh, colleague was saying earlier in terms of the fact that if you can't see and you can't read, that's something that's going to be harder to overcome, especially if that's happening um, at a young age. And so um, thinking about not only what are we seeing in terms of bright start intervention, but what other things are going on in the context of the community and the classroom in order to impact the outcomes for the child. Um, the other program that I wanted to talk briefly with you about today is the National Early Care and Education collaboratives initiative, which is funded um, through a cooperative agreement with the CDC. And in that collaborative model, which is based on a model that we used in Delaware um, at Nemours, um, and it really is adapted from the IHI model, um, goes into really looking at when you take an intervention, you bring like-minded people together in the room who can learn from each other, um, how can we start to impact the um, policies related to healthy eating, physical activity, screen time, and breastfeeding support in early care and education settings. And so you can see here there's um, a five learning sessions over the course of the year, homework in between. Um, our, cohort, our first cohort is currently finishing up um, its fifth learning session. There were seven organizations in six states, more than 52,000 children, um, and we are providing and expecting data in the fall of 2014 to really start to see what the impact of this intervention is. But once again, it's when we join with the education sector, think about how we can use the place where kids are spending a majority of their time to make interventions that will impact kids' health outcomes um, and do it in a way that's sustainable. So it's not just the kids that are in child care centers at this particular time, but we're changing the policies and practices of those centers so that the next cohort of children that come into those centers are also impacted in the same way. Just a little bit about what the centers look like. Um, these are large centers that we're talking about, relatively high rates of subsidy um, and CACFP, um, a number of them participating in QRIS in the states that are available, um, and a, a big number of them in the preschool age, that's 37 to 59 month age range. Um, these are places where kids are getting their food. Um, it's being prepared in a um, number of different ways, um, but a large majority of them are preparing it on site, which gives us opportunities to impact how food is being prepared and provided to a number of children um, at the early years. Um, and we've really started to learn some important lessons about um, what is needed to make these impacts happen, um, not only at the center level, but at the state level, 
in terms of needing more organizational capacity and bandwidth, um, thinking about how to weave these things together. I think a lot of times when we talk about these interventions, they happen in silos. Um, how can um, states that are implementing the early care and education learning collaboratives begin to weave those into things like QRIS or STARS programs or anything else that's happening in their states, whether that be policy, regulatory, et cetera. And really thinking about how we empower those who are teaching our kids to become the mentors in these areas um, and to be the role models in these areas. Um, we're starting to see some preliminary data come in. As I said, um, all of the data will be coming in from this first cohort in the fall. Um, knapsack scores are showing areas that we b most need to focus on in terms of improvement. Family education being a large part of that professional development, family style dining, et cetera. We are evaluating the initiative in a comprehensive way, and you can see that from the, the logic model. Um, and we're starting to roll out cohort two, both in two phases, phase one, which is three new states, and then also rolling out in cohort two, phase two, which is an additional number of collaboratives in um, the original six states. And with that, I want to turn it over to my colleague, Dave Nichols.